Hi. Hi! Pokemon is infamous for its randomness. Wild Pokemon encounters, critical hits, overworld spinners, you name it. RNG is baked into every facet of the game. If you played two games of Pokemon the exact same way, you'd get two completely different results. But what if you played more than two games? Like, a lot more than two games. Like... So, a hundred games at the same time. How is this gonna work? Ideally, I'd just run 100 games simultaneously, something like this. The problem is, if I did that, my computer would explode and I would die. Instead, I'm gonna use something called a shuffler. Shufflers are programs that you can load a bunch of games into, but you only play one at a time. Then, after some time, it shuffles to a random other game that's loaded in the program. So here's the plan. I'm going to run two shufflers simultaneously, each holding 50 games of Pokemon Sapphire. The games will be running at four times speed, and about every three minutes, the games will shuffle to another random game. So even though all 100 games aren't in play every second, they always have a chance of being the next game up. Up. So 50 games on the left and 50 games on the right. That is exactly 100 games. Or is it? Yeah, it is. That's how math works. But I'm actually playing one additional game. As these games are running and shuffling back and forth from each other, one game will receive all the inputs the entire time. But it's running in the background, so I have no idea what it's up to. I want to see if this game can accomplish literally anything. <laughs> so stick around to the end of the video and we can all see how far this game makes it. With everything ready to go, I kick off the run with the first two randomly shuffled games. Because I have one controller paired to both games, I can use the same movements to advance the games at the same time. The very first portion of the game is the tutorial, and as we approach the tutorial's end, we hit that three minute mark. That means the games are shuffled and new games begin, where I have the absolute pleasure of doing the tutorial 98 more times. Yeah, the first three hours or so are just gonna be going through this tutorial over and over and over and over and over again. So I begin the grind of Little Root Town, and every three minutes, the games reset, and I get to do it again. After about a half an hour, something new happens. The shuffler on the left starts a new game like normal, but the shuffler on the right switches to a game I've already started. So now, I'm trying to play two games with completely different movement. The tutorial again on the left, but brand new movement on the right. Being asynchronous is how 99% of this challenge will go. Very rarely will the games line up from here on out. This begs the question, how do you focus on two things at once? A question posed by ancient philosophers, clinical psychologists, and people who start a new TV show, but really they're just scrolling on Twitter the entire time. Oh. Couldn't get into Wheel of Time, huh? Were you watching it? Or were you looking at cats with jobs? <laughs> He's a mechanic! The answer is, you can't focus on two things at once. Not completely, at least. So I need some kind of system on where my main attention should be. The number one thing I need to consider are actions that are irreversible, meaning once I complete that action, I can't undo it. We have one of these within the first three minutes of every game. When you try to leave Little Root Town, you must make a selection on your starter Pokemon, a choice that you cannot reverse. Once you select that little dude, there's no going back. And if you pick the wrong starter, the consequences are catastrophic. The Mudkip line cruises through this game. It's basically the best starter of all time. Ask any Pokemon player. Torchic and Trico would make the game so much more difficult that picking them would qualify as a disaster. So anytime one game approaches the starter selection, I have to focus on that game. Nothing happening in the other game can have repercussions as big as this. At least, not yet. So with this strategy in mind, I continue through the tutorial sections. Some games at the very beginning talking to everyone in Little Root, some games fighting the rival, and some games making it to Petalburg to talk to Dad. All of these sections include long stretches of dialogue where I can kind of mindlessly click A, but I actually don't mind that. Like, when I talk to Norman, I have roughly a solid minute where I can solely focus on the other game, but I'm still making progress. It's actually great. I'll say it. I love long stretches of dialogue. I'll start a fan club for it, I don't care. Just me and the Scarlet and Violet developers. With every game only on screen for three minutes, every second of meaningful progress is important. If I happen to run into Rich Boy Winston right before the Petalburg Woods, I get trapped in this needlessly long zigzagoon fight, where Winston uses a full restore at low health. This is a huge time waster, and sometimes I even lose, meaning I have to try to avoid him again, which I am 
I'm bad at. And after three minutes, that game goes away, and I can't make any more progress until it randomly comes back up. With 50 games shuffling, it's like, see you in three hours, I guess. About an hour in, I shuffle to a game that's able to make it all the way to Rustboro. And because I need that sweet dopamine hit after jumping out of a truck 25 times, I pour all of my focus into the fight with Roxanne. I'm able to water gun my way to the very first gym badge. All right, we are over an hour, and we, we have a gym badge. One, one out of 100 gym badges done. Actually, one out of 800 gym badges done. But you know what? The first one's the hardest is not true, but it's fine, it's fine. The next few hours are a lot of the same. Every once in a while we get shuffled to new games, but mostly I'm getting accustomed to everything I need to do before the first gym. By doing the same thing over and over and over, I'm creating a standard path of actions to complete. Go through the woods, go to the Pokemon Center, then go to the gym. This helps me get some muscle memory, requiring less thought when later games go through these sections. It's also helpful for when I shuffle to games. I just kind of know where I am on my path and what I need to do next. But it's more than just a set path, I'm adapting too. And the more I do some of these things, the more I learn. Using Mudslap in that stupid Rich Boy Zigzagoon fight helps me take less damage, meaning I rarely have to do that long fight more than once. I make another change after my first game makes it to Duford Town and begins going through the Granite Cave. Not only is running into wild Pokemon a chore, but it requires so much more focus Focus, since I have to navigate through both the overworld and menus. So, I make a note for the remaining games that I need to grab repels at the Pokemart before I leave Rustboro, and start adding that into my standard path. This is why I also like to focus on games that are ahead, because I'll gain valuable knowledge that I can pass on to the rest of the games. Just before the 5 hour mark, I get my first second badge. Real progress is being made, and every second is an absolute joy. As I go through the early part of this game, I realize there's another irreversible decision that I need to be aware of. The first one was starter selection, but this time I need to be aware of learning new moves. If your Pokemon already knows four moves, the game will ask if you want to delete an old move to learn the new move. If you choose to do this, there's no going back. At level 10, Mudkip learns Water Gun, which is by far its best move by this point. However, Mudkip only knows three moves, so Water Gun is automatically learned. Great, can't mess that up. However, because it's the best move, the move that I'm using 99% of the time in the early game, it's in my best interest to move Water Gun to the first slot. I don't want to navigate to Water Gun every battle. I want to click A as fast as humanly possible, like I'm in a hellish version of Mario Party. But you probably know the downside of this. At level 15, Mudkip learns Bide, a move that, according to the official Pokemon website, sucks ass. But when the game asks if you want to learn Bide, what's the first move available to delete? I'll let this dummy show you. No! No, that's bad. See, this is, this is what happens when you're not paying attention to the right thing. At this point, a lot of my mudkips are evolving, and at level 16, Marshtomp learns Mudshot, a move I absolutely want to learn. But at level 20, Marshtomp can learn Foresight, blah. With some moves being good to learn and others not, I have to hyperfixate on what level I'm at so I can make the right move when the game prompts me. Because if I don't... Oh my god. Oh my god. Mr. Briny, let me talk to you. Thank you. <gasps> no! <laughs> Mr. Briny, you made me forget Water Gun. Ugh. Fuck you, Mr. Briny. We're pressing on, with some games making it past the easy second gym and taking that sweet ride over to Slateport City. There's not a ton to do here, so I keep my army marching north. And just after the eight hour mark, the first game makes it to the second rival fight. This is where... There are certain fights in this game that are absolute run killers. 
Usually that just means Pokemon that can do a ton of damage to you, like Grovile and its absorbs. But in this challenge, it's not just that. These fights require specific setups of moves and items to even have a chance of winning. And you know how hard that is when you have a whole ass other game running too? This is the first fight in the game that's really gonna require my full focus. So how do I defeat my rival's Grovile? My attacks do almost nothing to it, and I'm just a few absorbs away from defeat. Well, there's a few items I can pick up to help me out. The first can be found on the Slateport Beach, as a small tube child gives you the soft sand. This increases the power of your ground moves, and Mudshot is actually our best bet against Grovile. But the items that really make this fight possible are X items. Use two X attacks, and my Mudshots are doubled in power. Thankfully, Grovile is not the first Pokemon on May's team. That would be Whalmer, who knows Splash and loves to use it. This basically gives us free setup, so we can go into Grovile completely buffed. Eventually, I start buying an X Speed too, so I can outspeed Grovile on that first turn. This doesn't always guarantee a win, Mudshot can still miss, or we can get crit, but it makes the fight winnable like 95% of the time. Thanks to early game scouting of this fight, I can add X items into my Rustboro Pokemart stop for all the games that are still back there. I've crossed the 10 hour mark now, and all the games are starting to get pretty far apart from each other. I have a game make it all the way to Watson, but 30 minutes before this, I had a game that was just getting started. Yes, one game didn't start until 11 hours in. That's going roughly 218 shuffles without being selected. One out of 219 is about 0.4% or the chances that a rational person would select Chikorita as their Johto starter. Over the next few hours of the playthrough, I can feel my confidence increase as I get used to my plan. May sometimes takes a few attempts, but I'm winning more often than I'm not. I do have another game where I accidentally delete Water Gun for Bide, but that only happens in three games total. One of the games officially obtains the third badge, which becomes a walk in the park thanks to the move Mudshot. Let's talk about Mudshot, though. Mudshot is, without a doubt, the most important move that my starter learns. More important than Water Gun. Easily. You see, the Mudkip line doesn't learn another ground move until level 52, and it's the strongest overall move until we get Surf after Gym 5. Learning Mudshot is probably the most important event in this entire game, aside from picking Mudkip in the first place. But Mudshot's not quite like the other level up moves. Mudkip evolves into Marsh Tomp at level 16, and Mudkip also learns Mudshot at level 16, meaning that if I ever fail to evolve Mudkip, I cannot learn Mudshot. Full stop. This is horrible. To learn this move, I now have to ensure that the evolution goes through successfully, and then make the correct inputs to learn the move. The good news is, the evolution screen is pretty unique, so even if I'm focused on the other game, I can usually see it and avoid pressing B. The bad news is, stuff like this. Don't press B. Oh, that's gonna be a problem. Oh my god, that is about to be a problem. Why was that so bad? Well, let's see what happens when that game gets shuffled to again. That was really scary. That could have been really bad. Ooh. Okay. Save that one. This is the danger of the shuffler. You could be smashing that B button to get through dialogue, and without even realizing it, get shuffled to an evolution where you cancel and miss Mudshot. It didn't happen here, and it hasn't happened yet, but we have to avoid this a hundred times. But I press on, reaching the 15 hour mark, where most games sit comfortably somewhere between the second and third gyms. We of course have our ahead games, which have reached Mauville. We also have games with a level six Mudkip. Thanks for participating. The games that are ahead have defeated the third gym and started making their way up to Meteor Falls, where Team Aqua is injecting Zubats with steroids or something. I don't know, I had a hundred chances to pay attention and I did not. Not. Once I do that, I can run back to the fiery path and head to Mount Chimney. This is usually where Marshtomp learns Takedown, a strong move that helps against Pokemon that resist water and ground moves. The most notorious of these Pokemon is Archie's Golbat. However, Archie's team is set up in a way that makes 
makes the fight really challenging, and another potential run killer. Mighty Anna starts the fight with an Intimidate, reducing the damage I can do from Takedown and Mudshot. This turns a lot of two-hit KOs into three-hit KOs, just annoying enough that losing becomes pretty likely. And once I lose, I get sent all the way back to Fall Arbor, requiring even more focus that I'm not giving to the other game. But I'm still making adjustments as I learn more information. If I skip the Fall Arbor Pokemon Center, losing to Archie will send me back to Mauville instead, which is a much closer location. More importantly though, I start bringing a second Pokemon to this fight, because literally any other Pokemon makes my chances of winning skyrocket. By switching and sacking some low-level Mon, you get rid of the Intimidate nerf, and this allows you to two-shot Mightyena, two-shot Golbat, and one-shot Sharpedo every single time. Moving on, we get our first Swampert, and our furthest game gets to the fourth gym leader, Flannery, who is truly almost impossible to lose to. I'm also fighting all the easy gym trainers for free experience. With Flannery defeated, those games make it back to Mauville to start the journey to the fifth gym in Petalburg. Around the 30-hour mark, the majority of games have defeated Watson and began their trek to Meteor Falls, putting most of the games somewhere around this portion of the map. But having everything so condensed is really tough for this challenge in particular. Earlier, I talked about the pitfalls of the Shuffler, specifically switching to a game right in the middle of an irreversible action. But there's another danger of the Shuffler that may not be as intense, but it's way more prevalent. As I've mentioned, the Shuffler switches games every three minutes or so, but the game it goes to is random, and there's no way to tell which game that is. So, when the game switches, I just kind of immediately have to figure out what's going on in that game. Where am I? Where do I need to go? What am I doing next? That's why I have my set path, but when the paths overlap on the map, things can get murky. Let's say I shuffle to a new game and I'm standing outside the Mauville Pokemon Center. Do I need to go fight Watson? Did I just fight Watson and now I need to go north? Did I death warp after an Archie loss? Or am I on my way back after defeating Flannery? All of these paths go through Mauville. Why does so much of this game take place in Mauville? There's nothing even happening in Mauville. Every second I spend trying to figure this out is a second I'm not making meaningful progress. So I need to learn the indicators that give me context of what's going on. The best indicator is also one of the easiest to get to, and that would be what level my starter is at. I have these games down to such a routine that the levels are really consistent at each point in the game. Having this knowledge is critical because if you mess up, the consequences could be pretty severe. We're 35 hours in, and now the first few games are making their way from Mauville to Petalburg. I decide to go the Rust Turf Tunnel way so I can grab strength while I'm here. It's a bit of an endeavor to get back and takes a bit of focus to navigate, but ultimately, getting to Petalburg isn't too bad. But then, I have to fight Norman. Norman is insane. Slay King does ridiculous damage, and after I get through it, I have to deal with another Slay King. That also does ridiculous damage. Mudshot isn't doing jack, so I need a plan. My initial thought is to delay the Swampert evolution so they learn Muddy Water at 37 instead of 39, which is more in line with the level I'm usually at against Norman. However, keeping track of when I need to let an evolution go through or when I need to cancel is impossible. With the chaos of these games, I can barely keep track of what I need to do next, let alone a split-second decision with no visual clue to let me know if I'm level 36 or 37. No, thank you. Luckily, instead of the Muddy Water strategy, a much more viable option becomes clear. I can get through his first Slay King and Vigoroth without too much trouble, but his second Slay King is usually the one that lands the final blow. However, if I get my HP within a certain range, Slay King will see a kill with just one move. Focus Punch. That means he will always go for Focus Punch, a move that won't be successful if you land a move. By going for a move that can't miss, like Water Gun or Rock Smash, we can completely neutralize Slay King. This isn't a perfect strategy. The range for Focus Punch is kind of unclear, so I do mess it up sometimes, but it works a lot of the time. And that's good enough for me. My Norman strategy is solid, but now I need to walk back to Mauville the f again? I don't want to do that, so I pick up the HM for Surf, teach it to my starter, and fight some wild Pokemon. I'm already at low health from the Focus Punch strat, so now I actually try to black out, because I get sent back to the last Pokemon Center I was in. Well, if I never entered the Petalburg Pokemon Center, blacking out sends me to Mauville, exactly where I need to be. And with this amazing strategy on lock,
Over the next few hours, I'm able to execute the death abuse strategies, the Norman strategy, and using my indicators to keep myself sane as I shuffle to games that are all over the place. We're wrapping up our early gym fights, but we're also starting to make our way up to the Weather Institute and even taking on Winona, who's pretty easy. This is in large part thanks to Surf, a 95 base power water move that I always get access to and can't be accidentally erased. In the Weather Institute, we're given a gift cast form, which I could take or leave, but it's holding a very useful item, the Mystic Water. I switch the item onto Swampert right away in every game so I don't forget. Surf is now doing insane amounts of damage, and this is why picking Mudkip is so elite. We're approaching the 50 hour mark now. Yes, I've been doing this for 50 hours. And we're about halfway through the game. Some games are back in Mauville, wrapping up the third gym and first Archie fight, but we are starting to get past the sixth gym in a lot of games. This involves running down Route 120 and across 121. I dip my toes into Lily Cove, but we have something to do before we can truly explore the city. I climb Mount Pyre and get the orb to defeat Team Aqua. But now I need to fly to Slateport. Oh God, not HMs. To beat Pokemon Sapphire, there are six required HMs. The first is Rock Smash, which I've been teaching to Marsh Tomp because I'm lazy. The second is Surf, which is great. And the third TM is Fly. And yeah, I know it's not required, okay? But this challenge is chaotic enough. Imagine trying to go everywhere on foot. I would never know what's going on. Absolutely not. So I need to catch a Pokemon that can learn Fly. But in most games, I already have. Remember that second Pokemon I brought to help with Archie? If I was able to catch a Fly Pokemon, that's who I caught. If I didn't do it then, I tried to catch Wingles during my death abuse after Norman's gym. By the time I get to the top of Mount Pyre, I almost always have a Flying Pokemon and can go straight from here to Slateport. And then, since I walked into Lily Cove, I can fly straight there. and continue on. At this point, we're wrapping up the- <laughs> Bless you. At this point, we're wrapping up the early game of the earliest games, with the final game beating Watson. With all of my starter Pokemon leveled into the 20s, I can finally celebrate a major success of this challenge. None of my starter Pokemon failed their evolution from Mudkip to Marshtomp, meaning every single one of my games learned Mudshot. It's kind of unfathomable that I was successful every time, but oh my god did it make this challenge easier. What's the opposite of throwing for content? Uh, succeeding for sanity? <laughs> Some of my smaller mistakes mistakes are still causing issues though. The games where I accidentally deleted Water Gun are struggling, and in one game I don't have Takedown or Water Gun, so it's just been fighting Archie for like 30 hours. Additionally, there were a few instances where I just straight up forgot to get badges. The sixth badge was super easy to forget because you have to go past Fortree to get the Devon Scope, and if the game shuffles away during this time, I could forget to go back, instead just blindly trekking along. Also, in one game, I forgot to get the second badge, and I didn't even realize until I tried to fight Norman. There's no rational explanation for that one. I'm just an idiot. Into the 60 hour range we go, and the earliest games are now defeating Team Aqua in the hideout and surfing their way to Moss Deep. Here we pop into Steven's house and then make a beeline for the seventh gym. The gym layout here is a little tricky, so games that are here do require a little extra attention. Tate and Liza are really easy because they only have a Soul Rock and a Lunatone. Two surfs usually do the trick here. Things can get a little complicated if they use Sunny Day or put Swampert to sleep, but generally everything here goes fine. Once they're defeated, we can surf south to reach the location of the seafloor cavern. Getting to and getting through this cave requires two more HMs, Dive and Strength. Swampert can learn both of these, but there is a bit of a problem. If Swampert learns these two moves, his entire moveset will be HMs, which is okay, but that means he can't learn Waterfall, the final required HM. It also means he can't know a ground move, which is very nice for some of these late game fights. Teaching all of these moves to Swampert is a bad idea, so I need another HM user. That's where Tentacool comes in. Tentacool can learn Dive and Waterfall, allowing Swampert to just learn Strength and freeing up a move slot for a ground move. Tentacool is also extremely common on surfing routes, so I start working a Tentacool catch into my plan. With so many games, you'd think it might be hard to keep track of which games have a Tentacool already and which ones don't, but the little Pokeball icon in the wild Pokemon screen is an amazing indicator. The Seafloor Cavern has a few Strength puzzles that require a bit of focus, but the Archie fight at the end is super easy. When Kyogre awakens in the deepest part of the cave, Archie warps you out with him 
Canyon, meaning no backtracking is necessary. Now it's a quick surf and dive over to Sutopolis, where Kyogre can be caught. Kyogre is a very useful Pokemon for me in this challenge. Not only is it a free level 45 Pokemon with legendary base stats, but its ability Drizzle puts up rain automatically, and in Gen 3, permanently. This is extremely helpful if I need to switch in Swampert, whose water moves get a boost in the rain. To catch Kyogre, the absolute easiest thing to do is use the Master Ball. This item can be found back in the Aqua Hideout, and is only about a 30 second detour to get it. I knew from the start that I needed the Master Ball, so it was part of the path I always executed in the Aqua Hideout. Once I'm inside of the Cave of Origin, it's essential that I don't run away or kill Kyogre, making the catching of this Pokemon another irreversible action that I have to pay very close attention to. Failing to catch Kyogre would be very bad. But once we do that, we can escape rope out, and now it's time to take on the 8th gym. But around the 70 hour mark, that's just the furthest along games. Let's check in on some of the straggler games. Oh man, really struggling with the map. You got it, buddy. Wow, that game is so far behind. How did that happen? Oh crap, I used my master ball on a tentacle. That's so embarrassing. No, that's actually fucking horrible. <laughs> Using the Master Ball before Kyogre means I now have to catch a legendary Pokemon in a much worse ball, which not only wastes time and money on lots of Pokeballs, but if I accidentally kill Kyogre, I can't catch him. All right, this is the biggest mistake I've made so far. Every other game has successful catches though, and can move right along to the eighth gym. Not only does the puzzle in this gym require more focus than usual, but for the first time, we actually have some struggles from the game running at four times speed. Sometimes I just want to turn, but I end up walking through three spaces instead. Fighting the gym trainers actually becomes part of my path though, because during this time, Swampert learns Earthquake. This can finally replace Mudshot, and turns the Wallace fight into an Earthquake showcase that's almost impossible to lose. A few of the games now have received all eight gym badges, and with nothing else to do plot-wise, I can surf over to Evergrande City. Victory Road can be a little tough at first, especially in the dark, trying to remember the most efficient route, but it's not bad. There's a few Pokemon who seem specific designed to kill Swampert, but now we have a powerhouse in the back who can come in and win. Kyogre also knows Ice Beam, which is super helpful against the Grass Pokemon and Wally's Altaria. So around the 80 hour mark, we have a few games make it through to the Elite Four. Once we're here, we can buy some items that will be helpful, including Hyper Potions and Revives. We have tons of money from basically being overleveled and sweeping through the late game. Now, we're ready to take on the Elite Four. But before we do that, let's check in on that Master ball -less game and see if we were able to catch Kyogre. No? And we're wasting all of our Pokeballs that won't even come close to catching Kyogre? Neat! This whole run, I've been going out of my way to fight patches of extra trainers because I want to be the highest level I can reasonably be. And that's because I know how challenging the Elite Four can be when you're basically doing a solo run. Having five fights of high-level Pokemon back-to-back -back is no joke. And the last thing I want to do is have a weak Swampert that struggles with the Elite Four. That would make the end of this run absolutely excruciating. So with the Elite Four starting at level 46, I enter around level 57, which is a really solid level advantage. In my first few forays into the endgame, I'm just making gut decisions on what might be the best option. Sydney, Phoebe, and Glacia all have their problem Pokemon, but things really take a turn when I get to Drake. And when I say take a turn, I mean for the easier. Drake gets absolutely annihilated by Kyogre's Ice Beam, and Steven is actually pretty easy too. After after 81 hours and 33 minutes, the first game is finally done. I can now mark that game as complete, so the shuffler will stop shuffling to that game. Just 99 more to go. As many of the games enter the Elite Four, a lot of games are still playing catch up, some as far back as Norman. The problem though, is that each Elite Four game requires so much focus, since every Pokemon I'm up against requires a different tactic. That means the games that are behind get even further behind. Eventually, I develop a solid strategy for the fights. Sydney requires a back and forth between Swampert and Kyogre, but changing the setting to switch mode makes this way easier. I put up rain against Phoebe and Surf Sweep the rest of the fight. Against Glacia, I use an X attack and run the fight with Earthquakes. Almost all of Drake's Pokemon are four times weak to Ice moves, so Ice Beam Kyogre is a dream. I have to be a bit careful about PP, but with careful planning, it's not a problem. 
PP is also an issue with Swampert's Surf, but thankfully I have one item in every game that saves the day. A Max Aether. Surf cleans up the Steven fight, and I'm entered into the Hall of Fame, game after game after game. That was really successful. Hopefully some of that success can translate over to the struggling Kyogre game and... Oh, I killed Kyogre? As more and more games make it to the Elite Four, I often find myself in two different battles at the same time. This can be really difficult to juggle, since sometimes the best move isn't located in the same slot. If I'm able to, I'll often try to only play one game at a time, leaving the other two kind of stand awkwardly in the corner of the members' rooms. The games are finishing quicker and quicker now. 20 games are done, then 30, then 40. I finally hit 100 hours of playtime and have to change my layout to fit the length of the new timer. Sometimes games are lagging behind, sometimes I make mistakes in the fight and have to use a bunch of revives to cover my ass. But more and more games are finishing, and I'm feeling pretty good. The more games that finish, the fewer games to shuffle to, so each game comes up more frequently. 50 games are done, 60, 70, 80, all in a matter of hours. The kyogre game gets through the early Elite Four. I really struggle against Drake, though. Without Ice Beam, every Pokemon takes multiple moves to kill, just barely getting through with enough PP. Oh, shoot, this is the last one I didn't even realize that it, we switched to it. Okay, we're struggling. <sighs> he has just too many full restores. I don't think I can compete. <laughs> Since I had to redo the entire Elite Four, the game without Kyogre becomes the last game to finish. But this time, I have a plan to make sure I don't run out of PP. First, we're gonna use our Ether on Surf. We're gonna use Roar. We're gonna teach Roar over Earthquake. Then we're gonna teach Earthquake over Roar. <laughs> and then we should have 10 PP for Earthquake. If I just remembered to do this the first time, none of this would have happened. And Armaldo with few to spare, with a few PP to spare. We have defeated a hundred games of Pokemon. Just like that, just like that, just just like that. Super easy, just 107 hours later. I have defeated a hundred games of Pokemon at the same time. But wait, because we still need to see where that 101st game ended up. Let's see if it accomplished anything. I booted the game up and I was standing outside the Rust Turf Tunnel. Seems like a fair amount of progress. I checked my team and I had three Pokemon. A screaming level 36 Sceptile that I somehow managed to teach Cut to, a screaming level 9 Cascoon, and a non-screaming level 5 Wormpole. And now the moment of truth. Did this game somehow find a way to get any gym badges? It actually did. Somehow. Against all odds, it managed to get the first badge probably had something to do with the thousand hours of gameplay. Congrats to me for getting a grand total of 801 gym badges. If you're interested in trying this challenge out for yourself, I would reconsider.